Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm your host, Andy, and I have Adam here co-hosting the show with me. How are you doing, Adam? <laughs> How are you doing, Andy? I'm well. Good. So this week, we're going to continue our conversation about ransomware protection. And I want to start off by just mentioning the news. If you're not in information security or you don't follow the news for cybersecurity like some of us in the industry do, you may not realize just how many incidents there are. There are a few that struck me as standouts for example, Carnival revealed that they were hit by ransomware in August. And as part of that ransomware attack, there was information that was siphoned off, passports, customer names, addresses, PII. Additionally, there was a school district, and I mentioned this previously in August, there were a lot of school districts that were hit by ransomware. Uh, Massachusetts had one this week where there was an entire uh, school district that, that had their uh, schools closed because of a cyber attack. Talk about kicking two different groups while they're down. Carnival Cruise Lines, of course, has been struggling financially, and schools are struggling so hard to find the right model to educate our children, and the cyber criminals don't care. So there really is no scenario where they're not going to come after you, whether you're trying to educate people, whether you are a business that has been impacted almost more than any other by the pandemic, they're still coming after you. So your your cybersecurity posture has to keep up no matter what. Yeah, we had mentioned that you know not only do cyber criminals not care, but cyber warfare in general has collateral damage. Maybe you're not the target. Maybe your networks are just connected in a way and inadvertently you suffer from the attack. Cyber warfare just has no boundaries. No Geneva Convention either. Exactly. We had mentioned also a few episodes back about the zero logon vulnerability in Active Directory domain controllers. This week, Microsoft revealed that there are cyber criminals that are starting to incorporate exploit code into the zero logon vulnerability in their attacks. And that's driving ransomware as part of their attack strategy. So if you haven't patched it, definitely do it. But that just goes to speak that ransomware is still very, very prevalent. And there's still a lot of companies that are susceptible to it. One of the most interesting pieces of news that I have found this week as well was Microsoft actually executed a coordinated legal attack in a bid to disrupt the malware as a service botnet TrickBot, which has been well known within the cybersecurity industry as a global menace that has affected millions of computers and its use to spread ransomware. Whenever we start traveling again and meeting in person again, if you work for a larger company, you may get the opportunity to go to Redmond and do an executive briefing center visit. If you do that, one of the offerings will be a chance to go visit Microsoft's Digital Crimes Unit. It's usually part of the same trip as also visiting the Cyber Defense Operations Center. Either way, the Digital Crimes Unit is really interesting because they use these legal means, like Andy referenced, to take down botnets, child pornographers, and other really nasty groups and organizations. And so their presentation is really interesting. It's not that long and definitely worth your time. And it's really interesting because Microsoft is a civilian company, and they have this Digital Crimes Unit that partners with local law enforcement, government law enforcement. It just goes to show that Microsoft really does take security very seriously, even for a civilian company, that they're willing to partner and do work outside of their normal business. Mm -hmm. So the first topic that we're going to dive into this week in kind of showing up your defenses against ransomware is the concept of least privileged access. And this is something that if you read through the article that I had posted in the notes last week from Maersk, this was the thing that took them down really because they had a culture within the company to just provide admin access whenever it was requested. And that's kind of how a lot of companies start out as well, that users 
or admins just need admin access to their own workstations or to servers. It's very common to grant domain admin right away because that's the easiest thing to do or global admin to Azure because everyone just has the permissions that they need and you'd rather give them the permissions than to take the time and work to segregate out their permissions and provide just what they need for that particular moment. And so one of the th- concepts that we want to make sure that this comes across is you don't need 20 domain admins. You don't need 20 global admins for Azure. You need to take a look at your administrative access and pare it down to the specific roles that people need. There are roles within Active Directory, built-in groups, as well as within Azure, and a lot of other SaaS solutions will have different roles. And it's important to figure out what roles that you need to assign to the specific group of users to give them just the privilege that they need to do their jobs. The other thing is local admin on workstations. And this kind of gets a little bit touchy because usually people like to have control on the workstations. And a lot of companies start off by just granting access to local admin on those workstations. But that can be very dangerous because anything that you do, any malware that you click on or any malware that's living there, if the logged in user is a local admin, then you are going to be susceptible to those privileged access and it'll be able to run those privileged process with that local logged in user. And it's a very tough shift to go from local admin to a normal user or what they used to call like a power user because that's a culture shift and that's something that can be difficult to do. But if you can do it, it'll pay off in spades later on. I asked my boss recently when he decided to do this, because at our company, one of the biggest things that I found that was great for our security was that right off the bat, all users by default are not local admins on their own workstations. Obviously, there are exceptions, but I asked him recently when the company had made that switch. And it was when he first started at the company. As soon as he started, he made that decision and all workstations from then on, every one that was issued out, the user was not a local admin. Now there were a few hundred maybe users that were previously local admins, but after that, you know, the company grew from a hundred some users to now we're at four or 5,000 and that practice has continued and it's very, very strong for our security. Andy, was that done through attrition? From the 100, it was done through attrition. So they never went back on the 100, you know, when he made the switch, they never went back to remove them. So when the users got new machines, they were just issued a machine and they weren't to the local admin after that. I think that's really the right way to go about it. It spreads out the pain so you don't have this big bang effort where you ripped it away from a bunch of people and they're all howling at the same time. But also it's it's kind of, it aligns with other change too. And it feels less like you took away something and more like you gave somebody something different. And that's probably more effective too. So that's that's interesting. A lot of places don't do it through attrition, but that feels like the right way. Yeah, it's just depending on the risk. You know, we had that risk conversation. What's the risk to the company versus the impact to the users? And also, how long is it going to actually take? If you have a company of 20 to 30,000 some users and they're issued a workstation for three or four years, you know, some five, six years at some companies, it can take a very long time through attrition to get to that point. Yeah, it's it's definitely one of those security posture improvements that certainly is going to improve your security posture, but it also is high on the effort axis. So it is high reward, but high effort to get there. And there's so many things you can do that are very impactful as well, but are lower effort that might be a better thing to bite off first. So that's why I was kind of liking the attrition idea is because I think that makes it much less effortful. And also, it just helps with change management, too. And I'll share this tidbit as well. When you do move to something like the model that we have, you have to be prepared for your service desk to answer those calls to install the applications that users need. And you're also going to get users who demand admin access. And so we get those quite a bit. For the application installs, we usually funnel those to our Tier 1, Tier 2 service desk and desktop support. But when someone's requesting a new local admin account, then we usually do the evaluation. And sometimes I ask them, you know, how many times do you expect to 
install a piece of software and it's once a week. You know, if it's not something that you're running on a daily basis, like developers, they're running escalated command prompts and PowerShells. If, if that's not part of your daily job, probably don't need local admin access. One of the other things you have to balance with that as well is that it drives a lot of shadow IT in an organization, especially I think a lot of the success, especially early on that the new smartphone platforms and the tablet platforms like iOS gained such a foothold in enterprise because there wasn't the ability to manage them to the micromanaged level of Windows endpoints. They just didn't have that management infrastructure. And so when they started to come into organizations, I could install any app I wanted. I could kind of do whatever I wanted. And my Windows PC was completely locked down and had nine agents on it and was this super gross, miserable experience. And my iPad was super snappy and responsive and I could use whatever I needed to get my work done. And I think sometimes we can do that and pat ourselves on the back and say what a good job we did at locking this down while our users are just going to go to another avenue. And it becomes kind of that game of whack-a-mole. So there is a balancing act here too, where again, I, I see the benefit benefits in in risk reduction, but I also caution that tightening the screws on everything too much just drives people into other behaviors. And then you buy other tools to start discovering them. And it becomes kind of this never ending game of chasing that white rabbit. But that's security, right? (laughs) It is. It's a cat and mouse game. So the next topic that we wanted to talk about is very important email protection. It's something that everybody struggles with. Email is by far the number one vector for the majority of attacks. Users will click on links and put in their credentials without thinking twice. You know, one of the things to have is definitely a good security training program, but at the same time, you need to have those technical guardrails for users. Whatever email solution, and you know, we've we talk about Microsoft a lot, and we assume a lot of the people who listen to this podcast have. Office 365. So if you're a G Suite type of user uh, or company, the protections that we talk about may not apply, but, you know, G Suite has other tools that they can, they can use. There are platforms that can integrate with those as well because they tie in at the MX record level at the MX record. Correct. Yes. So, you know, there's a bunch of tools like Mimecast and Proofpoint and, and uh, Office ATP that you can get. I do want to say though, for Office 365, you get Exchange Online Protection built in, and then you can add on the Advanced Threat Protection. So Exchange Online Protection, for those who aren't familiar with the differences between those two levels, is your, if you think of security, I mentioned this concept in the last show, as a funnel where we're trying to funnel down the number of malicious emails or attachments or links that move to the next level, our initial widest mouth of the funnel is going to be Exchange Online Protection or EOP. And that's doing that really basic signature-based, heuristic-based kind of detection. Think of it as something that's not computationally expensive, right? It's the really easy wide swath that's going to capture the most obvious garbage messages and take them out. And that's still needed, right? Because we have to whittle down what does get through so we can focus our efforts on those. Then you think of the next step Andy mentioned uh, is a product that used to be called Office 365 ATP. It's now known as Microsoft Defender for Office 365. And that is your advanced email protection, phishing protection, malicious link, malicious attachment protection kind of product. And that's where you do the sandbox detonation, the advanced ML models, artificial intelligence, all of that really computationally expensive stuff that just takes more effort to do on a per message basis. And that is what's going to give kind of that competitive product to the Mimecast and proof points of the world, because they're doing a lot of that same sort of thing as well. If I owned a third-party product like Mimecast or Proofpoint, and then I'm still an O365 customer, can I use the Mimecast or Proofpoint threat product with EOP? Yeah, in fact, you can't. You can't turn that off. EOP is always enabled, and that's that's kind of your basic filtering. So that's always going to be in place. You can even run two email 
advanced threat protection products on top of each other, like run it through Mimecast first and then send it to Microsoft Defender for Office 365. The only problem with doing that, and and this is true of any of these products, is that they look for all of the signals that come in the original message. Once the message has passed through one of those providers, it becomes altered and a lot of the signals that help those products make those determinations are gone. And so what you'll see people do is they'll do a bake-off where let's say they're a Mimecast customer today and then they're evaluating Proofpoint. So they'll put Proofpoint in front of Mimecast. Proofpoint will catch a ton of stuff because again, think of this as a funnel. And then Mimecast will catch you know less. And they'll go, oh, well, Mimecast isn't catching very much. Well, A, it's not getting those unadulterated messages. And B, you've already taken out a lot of the, the obvious ones. So it's a really bad way to do your evaluation. What you really have to do, because these are all MX record based, the, the minimum level you can test them against each other is per domain. So if your organization has multiple domains, you can target one domain at, say, Microsoft Defender for Office 365, and you can target another domain at Mimecast. Cast and, and that's a more fair way to do a fair evaluation of the two and kind of compare what you see coming into both. Uh, one other note about Microsoft Defender for Office 365 that differentiates it a little bit. Number one, if you're in Office 365, it's going to be the only product that can evaluate messages that are internal to internal. Because those don't do an MX record lookup, they never are going to pass through your external providers like a Mimecast or Proofpoint. So you only have coverage of those if you have Office 365 or Defender for Office 365 turned on. The other thing is that product also covers files that sit in SharePoint Online, OneDrive for Business, Microsoft Teams, also URLs in Microsoft Teams chat, URLs in Microsoft Office documents as well. So it's more than just email protection. It's kind of email and file protection across most of the Microsoft 365 stack. So just something to know as you do your evaluation and you compare different products, there are definitely some differentiators that are unique to Microsoft Defender for Office 365. Yeah, we talk about those layers of security. And when you have a product that just evaluates the emails, that's great. Office ATP, or um, now called uh, Microsoft Defender for Office. Is that correct, Adam? Yep, you got it. That uh, evaluates those links within the Office files. So if I open up a Word document and I click on a link that then redirects me to a malicious URL, if I didn't have Office ATP or the new name for it, my defense would be my endpoint protection or maybe a network filter of some sort to protect me against that. Whereas this just adds on another layer that it's included. You get the email protection, but then you also get the URL protection and file protections within the office suite, which I think is really great. Mm -hmm. So as part of email protection, there's also methods and products that you can get to report malicious emails. Sometimes these will these products will have phishing campaigns and trainings built in. Sometimes it's a product on it all by itself to just report phishing. You can do like basic reporting where it sends it to say a shared mailbox and then you manually evaluate it. And if it is malicious, you can use your email threat protection to remove or look up that malicious email and remove it from the box, which is all very manual, very labor intensive. Sometimes these products will have some sort of threat intelligence built in so that when you report the message, it will feed it into an, a threat intelligence, analyze the email to see if there is any malicious material within it, files attached to it, URLs that will point to malicious domains, and then basically send you back a message saying, yes, this was malicious, or you don't get anything back saying that it was. And if you get something back, you still have to go back to your, your threat product and remove that email manually. Some of the third-party ones that may be in this space you may be familiar with are FishMe, CoFence, KnowBefore, and those are all third-party ones that you can purchase, have Outlook plugins that you can teach users to hit the fish button, and usually it'll remove the email from their inbox if they think it's phishing, and then go to like a shared mailbox or the threat feed. What you might not know is there is a feature within Office 365 that's built in with a plugin that users can report phishing, spam. I think there's a couple different categories for it. And that goes to your Office 365 threat. And I believe that's included in the base Office 365 E3 licensing. Is that correct, Adam? 
Yeah, so since forever and ever, there's been the ability to report malicious messages to the Exchange Online team. And so those can get added to Exchange Online protection, essentially. And then Microsoft Defender for Office 365 offers the ability to use the fact that a message was reported to kick off an automated investigation and response. So there is some some automation in that product where you can build out kind of a playbook of what to do when a malicious message is reported. And so when a user does that report, it can kick that off. So user reports a message, it can search other mailboxes for the same message, automatically quarantine those message, do interesting things like that, or remove it from mailboxes, block it at first sight, all that good stuff. So there is some automation there that you can build on top of the reporting, which is pretty interesting. And, you know, we've had this conversation about best in suite versus best in breed. And while each one of these individual products are nice and do their job, having that threat feed and integration can be a lifesaver when it comes to time management. So in the example of a malicious email getting sent to, you know, 10 users at a company, say Adam and I are at that company, and I report the message as malicious... If I just had a third-party product, that would go to a shared mailbox or you know the security team to analyze. Maybe it goes to a threat feed and then comes back and says it is malicious. The security team would then have to go to a threat email threat product to remove it from everyone's mailbox. And at that time, that email may have already been opened by several people. Maybe the file has been downloaded and now you're depending on your endpoint, endpoint protection to protect you from that malicious URL or file. Whereas, you know, if you're on the entire Microsoft security, if someone reports the message, and that includes anywhere in the world, right, Adam? If if someone from another company reports a message that's seen in the wild for the first time, that'll feed into the threat intelligence and should come back to my company, right? Yeah, that's so you'll hear Microsoft talk about something and and they talk about it a little less today, but You'll hear it referred to as the intelligence security graph. And the idea is it's a fabric that links together all of the different security solutions like endpoint and email as the example here. So kind of two different ideas that that go both ways. So example number one, a new threat, zero day comes in, has never been seen before. Microsoft Defender for Office 365 detects that there's something suspicious about it, and so it detonates it in a sandbox. And sure enough, it's a malicious file. It can then send the hash of that file to Exchange Online Protection, so it can be blocked at first sight when it comes in next time, so it doesn't have to keep getting detonated in the sandbox. That's beneficial. That way, every organization that just uses EOP, now they're protected, even if they don't own that advanced threat protection product. The other half of it is that intelligence can also be fed into Microsoft Defender antivirus for endpoint and infuse that intelligence there as well. So you really do have a pretty amazing idea that even if it doesn't happen, first sight isn't in your organization, patient zero isn't in your organization, you can still benefit from that threat intelligence. And in a point I made in a, in a past show as well, is that as so many of these security vendors become myopically focused on enterprise, Microsoft still has a major presence in consumer. And so patient zero could be a consumer. Somebody sitting at their house in Tennessee tries to download a file from a website that's weird and endpoint protection detects it and infuses that intelligence all the way up the food chain back to email protection. And that's something that the proof points and Mimecast of the world are going to struggle to compete with because they don't have that telemetry from the consumer side of the world. And consumers still do risky things and still encounter zero-day threats just as much as organizations. So we we need to include them in our uh, threat intelligence. But whatever product that you go with, it's very important that you have some sort of threat protection sitting at your MX record level so that when a user clicks on a link, when a user gets a malicious file sent there, that there is at least some protection there. Obviously, you have the EOP built in with Office 365, but having that extra threat protection on top of that is extremely important in today's ransomware world. I don't know what the percentage is, but by far, as I mentioned previously, email is the chosen method for attack by majority of cyber criminals. That number is 95%. Thank you. 95%. Adam has it right, off, right in his pocket. When you read about all of these different ransomware cases, this is why they're most likely getting infected. 
some sort of file, some sort of URL that is embedded in an email that a user is going to click on and then combine that with, say, administrative rights on the machine and it will install you know, through some PowerShell script. Those two things combined is probably why we have so many cases of ransomware. So whatever product you pick, I think, is important to have this defense in place. Agree 100%. This is one of those things. And I can say from my visibility standpoint, talking to so many different enterprises, most of them do have some sort of advanced email protection. This is one of those that most organizations have recognized the need and have adopted. So if yours still hasn't, you are now in the minority and it is time to get some sort of advanced threat protection for your email. As Andy said, 95% of attacks come in through email and then I, the overwhelming majority of email threats are zero day. They're, they're threats we've never seen before, metamorphic, polymorphic style attacks, and they're just not going to be picked up by traditional signature or heuristic based detection. Doesn't mean those have no value because they still do get a lot of junk out, but you have to have the ability to do some of these more advanced behavioral detections, sandbox detonation, that sort of thing. It's just, it's, it's a need. It's a requirement for any modern security posture. To go along with that, you know, we mentioned at the beginning of this segment, as well as on previous shows, the importance of a phishing training program or a cybersecurity training program. Users are going to be your weakest link. You can have all of these different tools in place, but if the user who has administrative rights just go ahead and clicks on the link and, you know, stuff is going to get through. 95% attacks come this way, but there's other attacks that don't happen through email and, and other different methods. They need to be able to recognize the clues. And so having some sort of phishing training, a lot of these advanced email protections or reporting tools will have a phishing campaign type tool built into them. But it's important to have some sort of cadence to not necessarily trick your users. You know, training can be taken in a lot of different ways. Some people view it in the old school way of being punitive and saying, oh, you you failed, quote unquote, you failed this phishing campaign, and now you have to take this training. Or it can be done in a positive way too, just kind of guiding users along and even explaining to them, you know, these are tricks that you can use in your personal life when you're at home. When you don't have those advanced tools to help mitigate something that may happen, using this type of training and identifying the sender for the email or the the links when you hover over a link the link may not be the same as the the text that it's linking to you know those little tricks will help users anywhere uh, for whatever email that they have you know at our company we we have uh, a cadence to send out campaign almost weekly and then along with a monthly security article and we're trying to implement an annual type of security baseline training we have compliance training for other things that are at our company but i believe cybersecurity when i was in the military we had an annual security training that was a requirement to have in order to actually use a dod computer system. If you did not complete the training, your access to this computer system got cut off. One of the things I liked you mentioned there was selling this kind of training to your users as something that can benefit them in their personal life. I don't really consider that, but it's a really good point because they're not going to have that advanced protection at home, but they still need to know the signs of a phishing email. Everyone uses email. And so that's that's really a really positive spin to put on it. I really like that because we talked briefly at the end of last show about some users who thought the way their company did their phishing training was really non-empathetic because it came right after a whole bunch of people had been laid off and the phishing email was like a reference to a bonus or something. And it just was the wrong kind of message at the wrong kind of time. So I, I have heard of organizations being extremely punitive with this, and I really don't like that. Because you will never get a click rate to zero. And honestly, that should not be your goal because that's nearly impossible and you're spending way too much effort on it if you're trying to drive to something like that. This is where we build a defense in depth strategy. If you can get some users to not click something, then you increase your chances that it will come to people who won't click on it. And that is a win. Trying to drive that to zero is not as effective as looking at other parts of your security strategy. So here's one that a lot of people don't always consider. And this is, of course, uh, something that tickles my fancy is 
as, as somebody who's interested in identity as the control plane for a lot of modern cloud-centric security posture. We have found at Microsoft that the more that you prompt users for their credentials, the more likely they are to respond affirmatively to a phishing attack. Now, that sounds really obvious, but there's a lot of organizations that will say things like, well, we need people to keep signing in every every week or do an MFA challenge every 24 hours so we know it's them and we know they can still get in. And the thing is, you're kind of separating, not separating two concepts there, authentication and authorization. I don't want to go down a deep rabbit hole, but long story short, that's not needed. And in fact, that's not helpful. So as we think of ways to improve our chances of surviving a phishing attack or have a user not provide their credentials, one of the ways you can do that is actually revisiting your identity strategy and moving to a model where users are very infrequently asked to sign in again. In fact, Microsoft will tell you their vision is that a user should only have to sign in once per user, per device, per password reset. So if my password reset interval is 180 days, I should only have to sign in on my PC once every 180 days to like my Outlook app. And so I know I'm being a little contrarian here, but kind of turning this message on its ear, absolutely, you got to train your people, don't click on stuff. And if you do click on stuff, don't put in your credentials. But there's ways you can do that above and beyond just doing like really punitive training, I guess is the message I'm trying to land here. And so as as one final anecdote, I won't share exact data because A, I don't remember it, and B, I probably shouldn't. But one interesting anecdote is that at Microsoft, we actually have an extremely high click rate for phishing messages. Lots of people at Microsoft will click on a phishing link more than most organizations that do that kind of training, especially as a, you know, as a technology company. But Microsoft has a ridiculously low response rate to actually providing the credentials. Now, why is that? Well, Microsoft is completely passwordless and has been for many years. It's very, very, very rare to be prompted for your password on your PC at Microsoft. So if you click an email and it starts asking for your username and password, you are perplexed because you have single sign-on, because you have Windows Hello for Business. You never put in your password. And so that's one of those counterintuitive ways to get better at phishing is getting rid of passwords. And again, some people get really, really focused on, we got to get our click rate down to zero. We've got to punish our users. I know of companies that made their people who failed phishing attempts write an apology letter to the entire organization. And that's just like shaming people isn't going to solve the problem. But if you would actually, you know, look at some of the ways you could improve this, you could get more wins through doing different behavior. So totally on my soapbox here, but this uh, this is an intersection of some things that really interest me and um, want to give you something different to think about on this. And just kind of to tie this conversation off, when users send an email to our information security inbox and ask, is this a phishing email? Is this spam? Every time I respond, I put a positive spin on it. If it is legitimately a phishing email, I'll say, good job reporting this, you know, stay vigilant. If it's part of the phishing campaign, even though they could have used the phishing add-in to do it, you know, they forwarded the email, I still reply back and say, you know, this was part of the phishing campaign. You did a good job recognizing the clues. Keep up your, your guard. And if it's legit, I, I just send them back, you know, this this is not phishing. This is, if you look at this email, here are the reasons why you can tell it's it's legitimate. So, But I'm glad you're using the information security tools to try to report it either way. So I try to put a positive spin on it every single time. Positive reinforcement works better than negative reinforcement. Ask any parent. Well, that's our show for this week. There's a link in the show notes to our voicemail. Leave us a voice message or send us a DM on Twitter or LinkedIn if, if there's a security topic you want us to talk about or ask our opinion on. See you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.